I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, I plan not to keep you long, and I just feel like God does have a word for us today, and it's taken from our lectionary passage uh, today, and it's in Mark 12. It's a Mark, Mark 12, and I believe that it will be an impactful word for us today. Um, it will be on the screen really soon, but it's Mark 12, uh, 28 through 34. 28 through 44. And I would encourage, I know we have the, um, the big Bible here for your convenience, but it's always a good practice to look at it for yourself. Make sure you follow along on your phone or you need a paper Bible. We have those too. Because you shouldn't just take my word for it, right? It sounds like reading a rainbow. You know, nobody. No, y'all, too young, too young, too young, too young. She shouldn't just take my word for it. You should be able to read it for yourselves. Amen. So let's look at it. Mark 12. Starting at verse 28, here's another time where people try to hem up Jesus. They're always trying to trip him up, always trying to find, catch him slipping, right? So this is another uh, instance where uh, Jesus has a confrontation with someone. And it says in 28, one of the teachers of the law, also called the scribes, came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them good, a good answer he asked him, first of all, he should have just minded his business at that point. He going to try Jesus. Okay, here we go. He noticed Jesus gave him a good answer, and he asked of him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Trying to, you know, trying to see what Jesus is going to say. In 29, it says, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with, with what? All your heart and with your soul and with your mind and with your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is a few other great commandments. There's like three more above this. There is no commandment greater than these. Amen. Verse 32. Well, well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is none, there is no no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, he looked at him and was like, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Amen. May the Lord bless God's holy word. Come on, let's give it up for the clapbacks of Jesus. I don't know why they keep trying them. Our title today is simply uh, called The Goat. The Goat. If you are familiar with sports, then you know the term the goat. It is if you turn to any um, radio, sports radio, sports ESPN, you turn to anything, you will hear, often hear so many debates about the goat, the greatest of all time. People are always trying to figure out who is the greatest of all time. In basketball, you have the non existing argument in my mind. But the uh, argument between uh, LeBron James and Michael Jordan, if you are a product of the 80s, you know there is no comparison, but I will digress. People born after 2000 think it's LeBron. So, yeah, just, just stop. The GOAT! In, in baseball, Barry Bonds versus Willie Mays versus Babe Ruth. People are always trying to figure out who is the greatest in boxing. Muhammad Ali. Come on. But then they want to put him versus Mike Tyson. Like all these hypothetical situations. If he had been there. And it, 
you know, or Manny Pacquiao, y'all remember Manny? Versus Floyd Mayweather Jr. Who's the greatest in football? I hate to say it, but Tom Brady versus everyone. Can't believe y'all got me on, on camera saying that, but it's, it, it might be sad, but true. The goat, the goat. In our passage today, someone asked Jesus, what is the greatest? What's the greatest command? Of all the, can we got the Ten Commandments, don't kill, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. You read through the Old Testament, it's a challenge to read. Anybody try to, like, get through Leviticus, and you're like, whoo, how many more laws we got to do? Right. Of all these laws and all the things that, what is the greatest? They were really trying to corner Jesus because if he said the wrong thing, they were going to be like, aha, you said the wrong one. So Jesus gives his answer, and he says what we read today is the goat of all the commandments. This was familiar to the hearers at this time who was listening to Jesus because every good Jew always prayed the Shama. The Shama is a Jewish confession and is a, a faith recited by pious Jews every morning and every evening. If you go to Israel today, they will still be saying this every morning and every evening. It is recited uh, at the beginning of every synagogue service and at the close. And it's here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the great, and I love this. Because Jesus told them, yeah, these are the things. You've been doing it. Yeah, you right. You following along on, this, on the right trajectory. But, um, and then I, he said, you know what? If you just did these two, everything else would take care of itself, really. These two could encapsulate everything. Everything could be encapsulated in just these two verses. And, you know, we tend to major on the first one. Most church services is about loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, all our mind. All our songs are about this. All the time we're saying, lift your hands. Every time we're saying, repent or be in community. It's all about us loving God with all. Our God is an all-consuming fire. There's no halfway with, with God. God wants it all. That's just like trying to do a cannonball in, in shallow. No, you can't do it. Once you get in, you all in. But a lot of times that first commandment can feel a little performative. Like we want people to see how much we love God. I love God. You don't love God? That's how we go around. What's wrong with you? Because I love God. We want people to see it. I love God. I do the things. I'm in church. Some of y'all already put an uh, Instagram post like, going to church today. Church life. Right? Some of the, we, it tends to be performative uh, to, to love God. We want people to see that we love God. We want to do all the things. But that second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, I don't hear a lot of sermons about that one too much. We tend to, we tend to minor in that one because guess what? That one's internal. You can't see that one. <laughs> Right? The other ones, I can show you how much I love God. Love your neighbor as yourself is crazy. Just think about it. He said, no, you know, we, we want to focus all our time on God, and we love you, we love you. But Jesus is always like, no, run that back. There's one more thing you have to do before you get into that. So today, 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 I want to focus on that phrase. Love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody say, as yourself. As yourself. That is a powerful statement that we tend to just kind of go over. But can you imagine what kind of world we would be living in if everyone took that phrase seriously? If all throughout history, people really preached this sermon as much as they want to preach about everything else? And who doing what and what where and what who what way wearing and what you're not wearing and what you're drinking, what you're not drinking. What if this was the real message that went out throughout the would there be colonization? 
If you loved your neighbor as yourself, would it have even happened? Would there be crime? If you loved others as yourself, would there be murder or rape or predatory practices? Would there be high rent? I need somebody to read the word. Who over controlling these buildings? Love your neighbor as yourself. Would there be homelessness? It feels like Jesus was saying, I got the answer to everything y'all need if you just follow these two greatest commandments. A lot of foolishness wouldn't even take place. That just goes to show you how much people really read the Bible. People be saying they love Jesus and read the Bible. They don't, they don't really read the Bible because it's, it's in there. Somebody say it's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. Um, you can always tell what someone thinks about themselves by the way they treat other people. You can always tell. You know, you got that person that you know, get on your nerves a little bit or you can't quite figure out, like, what's their deal? Like, what's the problem? You can usually always tell how someone feels about themselves by the way they treat other people. Just keep looking straight. Don't, don't, worry, don't worry about who looking to left or right because this is going to hit home on a lot of hit home for me. Right? How you act at a restaurant to the little servers. How you, how you, how you drive. Help me, Jesus. How you treat the people who you are, are supervising or, you know, or you're a manager or you're doing, you know. If you're a teacher, how you treat people it shows up. It's a, it's a dead giveaway. You, you're giving yourself, you, sometimes you're showing your hand about how you really feel about yourself a lot of time. Racists, you know, all them little racist people, um, the ones who want to invalidate the imago dei, the, the image of God and other human beings, are really just showing people how they feel about themselves. That's why you can't get too rattled. Y'all be seeing all the little rallies, and I be like, how are they still ingesting all this foolishness? Well... If you can't see the dignity in other human beings, you're saying a lot about how you really feel about yourself. I'm just throwing it out there. If you don't have a, a, a lens of shared humanity, then you will believe that you are superior. Y'all following me? If you, if you don't feel like other people are human and you don't have a compassion, you're going to feel like, well, I'm superior. I have supremacy. My way is right. You are a heathen, right? This is, this is, how, this is, this is how we need these, these thoughts and these lenses in our mind because you always have to remember, and I love this phrase when it says, I am not better than anyone else, but no one else is better than me. That's how that's shared humanity. I'm not better than anyone else. But there is no one else that is better than me. Amen? That's how we share our humanity, which makes us reflect on how we treat ourselves. Now, this is where we got, I, I, already, I, don't, I, I was prepared not to hear one amen. So y'all can just sit and blink, and I will be fine. I mean, we'll just look at each other. Now, this hit, this hit me hard, too. It makes us reflect on how do we treat ourselves. And I'm not necessarily talking about self-care. Self-care is amazing. How many need self-care practices? Are you using your self-care practices? Do you even, like, did you try to do a self-care practice at least, you know, once in the, now and then? But I'm, I want to talk about um, a little, something a little different, different than just pampering. I want to talk about your soul care, not just your self-care, but your soul care. See, because we want to take care of this outside when it's really the insides that really need the most pampering. Needs the most pampering. According to this passage, Jesus is telling us that love is like a chain reaction. All right? In order to get love right, you have to deal with yourself. In order to get love right, you got to deal with yourself. If you don't want to uh, be a person full of toxicity and just be out here wilding, 
You have to do one thing. I love this about God. Because he could have just been there, just love God, you'll be fine. He's like, no, no, run that back. In order to do love right. How many want to do love right? How many have been in some situation like, I do not want to repeat that again. I've been in some situation, I can't do love like that no more. And I love, Pastor Mike says a lot, a lot of times we have been on either side. We, have, we could either have been the victim or the villain. That's why sometimes we be, you know, sometimes we got to admit like, yeah, that was me. I was wrong. Right? We want to get love right. So this passage is telling us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. So I have a few questions for you. What do you think about yourself? What do you think about yourself? Do you like you? I want you to just sit and think about that. Do you like you? If I were to walk up to you right now and ask you, hey, what are three things that you like about yourself? Go. How quick would you, would you be able to pull up that list? If I was to say, what are three things that you are amazing at and you're so proud of yourself? Go. Most of us would be like, um, well, see, uh, I got to think about it. Um, so I, I kinda, I'm kind of good at drawing, but not too much. Like, do you like you? How do you handle compliments? When somebody tell you, oh, you look cute, I like what you got on. Oh, child, no, this thing is, oh, I don't even, don't even, I got this at Ross, don't even, don't even. This hole on my hair is so old, I should take it down, I don't know. Somebody gave me this, you know, you know, gave me, it's a, how do you handle compliments? Anyone else struggle with that? Is anybody, is, am, I, am I alone? Right? This is, this is very telling. Do you like you? Because we either tend, and Nishari, I'm going to go to the, the, uh, the Isaiah passage. We either tend to question God about ourselves. And I love this passage in Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, 9. It says, um, what sorrow awaits for those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? Ooh, this one told me up. Do you like you? Do you like the way God has purpose for you to be? How you show up in the world? Your personality? How you look? Some of y'all look just like your daddy. Like, oh, you look just like your daddy. Anybody like that? Or you look just like your mom. You were supposed to look like your people. They'd be like, oh, I don't like my nose. I don't like my this. I don't like. If I were to say the same thing conversely, um, give me a list of 20 things you just don't like about yourself. You know how fast that list will go? That list, how y'all will be running up. I couldn't even hardly keep you from running. Like, stop. I just said 20, right? This is how we tend to do, God. I don't like it. Oh, what, what are you, why'd you do that? Why'd you make me like this? Why'd you do this? This is how we have to really sit. This is the pastoral care. We do have licensed therapists in the room, and they're going to, they could give me eye, eyes to make sure I'm on the, right, on the right track. But this is pastoral care. Things beyond this need to be, you know, let's, let, things are things you need to put on your check mark. I should probably go to therapy for this. Amen. Some, some things you'd be like, oh, you know what, I am struggling with that. I might need to unpack that with someone who's a professional, right? A professional is the key. Not, not Mika and them. All right, or, okay, so this is one. This is how we kind of tend to think about ourselves. Secondly, we, we, team to, we tend to uh, join, now this is going to sound crazy, but it's true. We joined Team Devil. Now, if I was to say, anybody who wants to be on the devil's team, no one would raise their hand. But according to the scripture, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. All, all, all he does is, is lie and accuse. He's so petty. Just goes around a little snitch. Just going around telling on people all the time. Who is, what, who, we give him too much pride. He just, right? So we joined Team Devil. We joined him in accusing God, we're snitching on our own selves. 
Dry snitching, that's what the kids used to call it. We snitching on our own selves. I don't like the way I look. I don't think I'm good at this. I have imposter syndrome. I'm not really able. I'm scared. I'm, we have joined the devil's campaign against ourselves. We've teamed up with him. Like, you know, we're, we're in essence, we're saying, you know what, devil, you're right. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I can't perform. I'm not, you know, I'm not able. Now, none of us would admit that we joined his team, but this is what we're doing in theory, right? So this is a good opportunity. Just sit and take this in. And it's going to be hard for some people to say, but we're going to say it as a community. I want you to put your hand on your chest and say, I like me. Come on, say it again. This is healing for somebody. I want you to say it out loud. Say, I like me. This is, a, this is, a, this is a, so good because before you can love somebody, you got to like them first, right? You get in a little relationship with somebody. You got to go through your little liking stage. Like, I think I like them. They cute. Right? You got to like yourself before we even move to the road of loving yourself. Amen? Can I get an amen? You got to like yourself. Because I got to tell you in Romans 5, 8, I like me. Not just because I'm cute, I like my hair, I like my, all that. I like me because God loves me. This is the deeper thing. We're not just doing affirmation. I love an affirmation. But this is deeper than an affirmation. I love me because God loves me. And how did God show God loved us? It says right here in Romans uh, 8, 5 and 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us. How did he do it? Well, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loves you. For God so loved the world. We, used to, we usually say, like, you are so loved. Yeah, kind of, that's true. But this is the way God loved you. God so loved the world, and this is how he did it. He gave his son. So if you are valuable enough for his son to give his life, then you are valuable enough. How, how, how insulting it is for the clay to be like, no, I don't like it. I don't like the way you, how insulting. If God loves you this much, then I can like me because God loves me. And this is something we could take to, take it in your back pocket. I want you to think about it. God loves us. So I like me. I wish I could fully do a, a, a quote by Cat Williams, but I can't in this context because he's speaking in other tongues. But he has such a great quote on esteem. Yeah, everybody's like, oh, look it up on your own time. He said, basically, in a in 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 G-rated version, I can't, how, how can I mess up your self-esteem? It's, it's esteem in yourself. How I, it's literally called self-esteem. So how am I messing up your self-esteem? That's the clean version. Because esteem means to respect or admire. Do you respect or admire yourself? What are you doing like the prophet Michael Jackson when you're looking in the mirror? My God. David said, I have to encourage myself in the Lord. Sometimes you need to get in that mirror and be like, huh, check it out. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Flaws and all. And a lot of these flaws, y'all better watch because that be whiteness. Don't be putting your flaws, comparing your, your flaws and thinking they flaws. That's not flaws. That's beauty. That's how we show up in the world. They're not flaws. You are made intentionally. So we tend to focus solely on the physical and not realize that our identity is in Christ. So, yes, all these things are great. We're trying to, look, we're trying to live our best life, but that's going to pass away. What really matters is who you are in Christ. See, this is where we, this is where we draw the line with affirmations. The affirmations are wonderful, but I want to know who am I in Christ? Because that's my real self. If you're looking for your identity, are you looking for a purpose? It's all in Christ. 
Everything you are looking for is in Christ. Here's just a short little list I want to show you. But when you're looking in the mirror, this is what, these are the things I want you to say about yourself. You see, you got the next one about, mm-hmm, yep, it's coming. Yeah, it is. These are things I want you to say about yourself. This is what really matters. This is how you love yourself. I'm chosen. I'm treasured. I'm secure. I'm free. I'm precious. I'm loved. I have a sound mind. I'm healed by his stripes. God lives in me. I am made in God's image. I am rejoiced over. These are the things to be celebrated, not what they're trying to sell you on TV and in a magazine. This is who we really are. Amen. This is how we love ourselves. You can't love nobody until you love yourself the way God sees you. I don't, I'm, I'm not really, I, I love getting older because I really could care less about what y'all think or uh, uh, your opinion or your validation because I'm, I'm this. Uh, y'all can all be sitting here booing me and I'll be like, okay, bet, yep, yep. Because this is who I am. In Christ, in Christ. Okay, you can take it off. The, the next thing I'm going to talk. I want to encourage you, if we are loving ourselves, loving our neighbors as ourselves, I need you to interrogate your self-talk. And this is where my, my, my mental health specialist will take it from here that you're going to make your appointment after this. But interrogate your self-talk. Sometimes we talk nicer to strangers than we talk to our own selves. We're more polite to people on the street than we are to ourselves. We yell at it at ourselves, call ourselves stupid. You always doing stuff. You always messing up. You always making bad decisions. Anybody? No, I'm just all by myself. Sometimes every now and then we get, you know, we get a little hard on ourselves. How do you talk to yourself? Is your inner critic motivating or condemning? Which one? Because it needs to be a balance. Sometimes you gotta, you know, sometimes you gotta kick yourself in the butt. And be like, girl, if you don't get up, you don't go to the gym, stop playing. Don't you go on that drive through no more. You have to talk to yourself. That's a good inner critic. But the one that tries to tell you that you're no good, you can't do it, you don't measure up, all those traumatic voices from the past, sometimes it's not even your voice, it's somebody else's voice that, that, that spoke into your life that you got to change the recording. Amen. This is the spiritual side of how you change your, your, your recording. There's a professional side that you can change that. But the spiritual side is that if it is true that life and death is in the power of the tongue, y'all believe the word of God, that's what it says, then what are you speaking life over to yourself? Do you speak life over yourself? Do you encourage yourself? You have a pep talk with yourself in the morning, like, girl, come on, we're going to do this. You got this. We can do this. I believe you got it in you. Everything, did you know, did you know everything that you need from God is already inside of you? Did y'all know that? A lot of times we pray, and all the songs are so nice, like more power, more love, more peace, you know, whatever. But did you know it's already in you? God already built you equipped with everything you need for life and godliness. So everything's already in you. What we have to pray is, God, make me more aware. Make me aware of the peace that's already in me. Make me aware of the love that I need to tap into. Make me aware. Make me aware. It's already in you. Amen. So interrogate your self-talk. Speak life over yourself. There is a principle in life that says you cannot give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. That's like going to a, a vending machine and you want something out there, and they, they said that this was on there and it don't come out. We call that fraud. That's, you're a fraud. You're fraudulent. You advertise something and you didn't have it. We are advertising that we are children of God, but don't have Love to give to our neighbors. We don't have nothing to give. We're not, we're not, we can't give what we don't have. So here's some things, just two things. I just want you to think, take it with you, think about it. Think about, these are a couple of things that 
You can't give until you receive it. Just two things. You can't give it until you receive it. Um, I'll go ahead and skip to the um, forgiveness. Forgiveness leads to peace. You cannot give forgiveness until you have received it. And I ain't going to get a lot of amens, but I know it's right. Yeah. You, can't, you have to first forgive yourself. There are so many things in our lives that we need to say, you know what? I, that was messed up. I was wrong. But I forgive myself. Why? Because God forgave us. He forgave us. And you can't give forgiveness to somebody. This is why people walking around with grudges. This is why we ready to fight on, on, on sight. What? Who said? Who they look? Oh, is there a problem? We, we on edge. Because forgiveness, you have to forgive you. This is going to be healing for somebody. Forgive you. It happened. It's true. But guess what? You learn from it. You still here. God allowed you another chance. And truth be told, if we was to tell all our stories, you'd be like, oh, you, oh, I'm not alone. All right. This verse is so beautiful. This lady came and she was crying at the foot of Jesus. And, you know, and they were in like, oh, she doing too much. And Jesus said, I tell you her sins and they are many. I was like, Jesus, you didn't have to read her like that. I like, you could have left that out. You could have just said sins, but I, all right, we're going to roll with it. Have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person, get this, who is forgiven little shows only a little love. When you forgive yourself, you're able to more freely forgive other people. You won't hold grudges as much, and it's going to lead to more grace. You'll give people opportunities, chances. Yeah, okay, it's all good. No, it's fine. You know, you know, we're not you know, letting people walk over us. You know, we still ain't, you know. We still. But at the same time, we're able to give people more passes. We, we're not jumping down somebody's throat on the first time. All right, I'm going to give you a little warning on that one. Usually I don't do warnings, but you're going to get a warning today because I am walking in grace. Right? So we have to forgive ourselves. Somebody say, forgive me. I forgive me. Come on, let's say it out loud because I know this is a tough thing. Say, I forgive me. I forgive me. I forgive me. I forgive me. And once I forgive me, then I'm able to show grace to others. Second thing, and this is my last thing, and we're going to move over to communion. Agape love. Things you can't give until you receive it. Now, agape love is different than any other kind of love. It's different than brotherly love. It's different than, like, a sensual love. Agape love is an unconditional love. It's a God kind of love. It only comes from God. This is not one you can muster up yourself. I ain't got it for you. You keep doing too much, I'm going to be like, well, you know what? It, it, this, is about, this is the end of the road. I'm going to sing you that song, and we're going to go our ways. Right? But this love is different because you have to receive the agape love that God has for us. I love this. It says uh, in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. That's the God type of love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Caveat, whoever does not love does not know God. Because God's love, that's very telling. So a lot of people you don't got to argue with. All the people at the little rallies, I don't got to argue with them. Christian nationalists, I don't have to argue with them. This verse reads you all by itself. If you don't love, you don't even know God. Unconditional love means that I love, I don't love I, I love you not because of, but in spite of. Not because of. Because I'd be like, well, because you fix me dinner sometime, I'll love you, know, right? That's because of. So not because of, but in spite of. 
That's unconditional love. Even though you're on my nerves and even though this and even though I'm still going to love you, it's unconditional love. And I'm just going to say this in closing. This is opposed to a narcissist love. So let's not get it twisted. A narcissist is someone who is extremely self-centered and has an exaggerated sense of their own importance. This is not the message on this day. To love someone as yourself does not mean that you are promoting yourself as greater, that you're being selfish, that you're arrogant, that everyone should bow down to you. That's not the, that's not, that's not the God type of love, right? God love is unconditional. This is what it means for us to love your neighbor as yourself. You got to work on you. You got to love you. You got to like you. You got to appreciate who you are. You got to appreciate what God made. You got to look at all the little lists you would have made of the things you don't like yourself and tear it up and be like, hey, this is how I'm showing up in the world. And I'm unique. I'm supposed to look like this. I'm not supposed to look like them or they or her, my hair and all that. I'm supposed to show up unique, just as unique as my thumbprint, just as unique as my DNA. This is how I'm supposed to show up. Let's show appreciation to the potter who fashioned us exactly how, he, how God wanted us to be and not poo-poo to the pot like, oh, I don't even like it like that. Let's just be grateful for our lives and our health and our strength and how God has caused us to show up in this world. This is a good segue that's going to lead us into our time of communion and even lead us into this week. I'm telling you, don't let these people trouble, y'all. All the rhetoric, all the people who supposedly are, are standing for God and God values, that, that's not true love. Our love is to love the marginalized. Our love is to look out for those who uh, are on the other side of justice. That's love, to love the oppressed, to love the ones who are not wanted. That is love, and to love those people as we love ourselves. Here's some reflection questions for you to take with. If you come to the village on Wednesday, we will be going into even deeper dive into these questions. But these are some things for you to just take away with you. I want you to think about throughout the week. Your questions is understanding love for self and others. How do I define love for myself? What does it look like in my life? How can I extend this same understanding and compassion to others? Because it flows from the inside out. To um, seeing others as God sees them. Do I see my neighbors as children of God, deserving of love and respect, what helps me see others this way and what makes it difficult? You got to interrogate these things. Yeah, if you're not thinking about these thoughts, you just existing. Come on. Uh, balancing love for self and others, loving others as I love myself requires a balance. How well am I caring for myself so that I can be present and compassionate towards others? What does healthy self-love look like in my life? I promise y'all, Jesus said it's the GOAT. It's the greatest commandment. You get this down, you love you, it's going to be easy to love others. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. Amen. So let's go ahead and stand. If you are here and you're saying, you know what? I need this type of love in my life. I promise you this is not a love that you'll get on a TED Talk. It's not a formula for it. You don't can't go to a workshop and do seven principles to love better. This is a love that only comes from Jesus. And this is the only a love that we have that's in Christ. None of these things you're not you're not even eligible for a, <laughs> these principles until you are in Christ. So um we always want to have a time of an invitation for those who might say, I want to be in Christ. I've realized that I need Jesus in my life. I've tried to do all these things on my own, and I, and I come up short time and time again. This is the day I want to surrender, and this is the day that I say, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. If there's anybody here in this place who would like to make that declaration, I just want you to raise your hand. Just say, hey, that's me. I want to do, do life with Jesus. 
I want to follow Jesus. I want to walk after him. I want to know Jesus more. And then secondly, if you're in the room and you're saying, yeah, I want to recommit to this life, just join me in this prayer. I'm just going to pray over us. God, I thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word that is, brings life, that opens our eyes, that illuminates, that uh, shifts our paradigms. God, will you help us to deal with this deep internal works that we uh, need to sit and grapple with and reflect on and interrogate, interrogate? God, will you give us, will you shed your, your love in our hearts in a way that's undeniable? God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us afresh. Come on, if you want the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh, God, I need a new infilling of your Holy Spirit in a way that I can appreciate how you've made me, where I can appreciate and like that, uh, the way that I show up in the world, regardless of the messages that I have received in the past. Regardless to all the ways that I have compared myself to others, God, I want to declare and use it as a form of worship to say, I like me. And I like the way I show up in the world. And I like the way you've made me. And I appreciate the gifts that you've given me. And I want to use them for your glory. None of these things are for me. It's for community. So God, will you just bless us with a new focus? Will you help us with our self-talk? Will you help us to realize who we are in Christ? And lean on those things. You help us to receive your love. And when we do that, then we can love others as ourselves. And then we can love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, with everything that's within us. So God, do a new work in us and we will give you praise and we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name.